boys, oh boys, when I was a kid, when I heard this title of this movie, I said to myself, I have to see it. One of the most interesting Hammer movies of the late 1950s. It's called The Stranglers of Bombay. It's exactly what you think it is. The Stranglers of Bombay is a 1959 British adventure horror film directed by Terence Fisher for Hammer, dealing with the British East India Company's investigation of the cult of thuggy stranglers in the 1830s. The film stars Guy Rolfe, Alan Cuth- Cuthbertson, and Andrew Cruikshank. Now, uh, written by David Z. Goodman, produced by Anthony uh, Hines, cinematography by Arthur Grant, edited by Alfred Cox, and music by the great James Bernard, came out in December of 59 in the UK, the States, 1960. 80 minutes in Lent and a big hit again in France, 950,000 admissions. Now, I must tell you that uh, you, I'm only doing this podcast as a, as a public service. I'm not judging the title or the content. That uh, 60 years ago was a much different ball game in regarding to Indian uh, tales of Indian lore or intrigue. And like I said, it was a British company. Captain Henry Lewis of the British East India Company is investigating why over 2,000 natives are missing, but encounters a deaf ear from his superior, Colonel Henderson, who is more concerned with the local merchants' caravans, which are disappearing without a trace. To appease them, Henderson agrees to appoint a man to investigate, and Lewis believes it will be him. However, is solely disappointed when Henderson gives a job to a newly arrived, oblivious Captain Connaught Smith, the son of an old friend of Henderson. Lewis believes an organized gang is murdering both the men and animals of the caravans and then burying the bodies and suspects that the culprits have secret informants among the merchants of the city. He presents Conrad Smith with his evidence in his theories, but is mentally dismissed. He is also later caught by the thuggies and sentenced to die by the bite of a cobra, but is rescued by a pet mongoose, forcing the cult's high priest to release him. However, Conrad Smith remains antagonistic and derisive towards Lewis, who eventually resigns his commission of frustration to investigate on his own. Ramda, Lewis's houseboy, believes he's seen his brother, Gopali, who disappeared some years ago and receives permission to search for him. Lewis later learns that Ramdas has been captured by the thugs when his severed head is tossed through the window of a bungalow. Soon after, the thugs compel Gopa, uh, Gop- Gopalai, uh, Das, a new inmate to the cult, to kill his brother. Meanwhile, the merchants decide to band together and create a super caravan whose size, as they believe, will discourage the bandits. The, high, the high-bound Captain Cunat Smith leads the caravan and foolishly allows the stranglers in the guise of travelers to join them. That night, the thugs strike one of their usual success, and all the caravan members, Connect Smith included, end up slain and buried. Now, Lewis and Lieutenant Silver, uh, uh, a cult member, uh, a very interesting plot point, by the way, investigate the caravan's disappearance. Lewis sees a scar that Mark Silver as a thuggy follower of Kelly and chooses him in self-defense. Lewis then discovers the buried bodies and returns to the cult's secret temple, where he is caught and set to die in a burning pyre. Gopalai Das, however, now haunted by his brother's death at, the, at, the, at the, his own hands, frees Lewis, who casts the high priest onto the pyre instead, and the two men escape in the ensuing tumult. Lewis and uh, Gopalai race to meet, uh, to meet Henderson, who is dining with, with Patel Shadi, the merchant's local representative and secretly a member, uh, informed of the thuggy cult. Gopali identifies Patel's chief servant as a thug. Patel kills his follower to hold his tongue, but exposes himself with his actions. Uh, following this, Lewis's resignation is revoked, and he receives a promotion from Henderson for his help in exposing the thuggy cult. The film ends with a narrative display detailing that the thuggy cult was subsequently wiped out by the British, and a quotation by Major General William Sleeman, if you had done anything else for India, we have done this one good thing. Now, Stranglers of Bombay is somewhat, somewhat historically inaccurate in describing the religious cult of Kali and the actions of the thugs, also known as Thaga, pronounced Tang. Using modern methods, the British succeeded in wiping out the cult, which originated as far back as the 6th century. Now, The Terror of the Tongs is a quasi-remake by Hammer in 61 and basically covers the same uh, basis. Now, according to the website, 1,000 misspent uh, hours, uh, a very interesting review. He said, actors aren't the only ones who can get typecast. 
In fact, sometimes it happens to entire studios. Despite their big image makeover in the mid-1950s, Hammer didn't dedicate her efforts exclusively to horror afterwards, even disregarding the super low budget travelogues and musical that the studio committed to continue to crank out in two and three world formats until the market for supporting shorts dried up and died. Hammer's offerings during the second half of the 1950s were a little more diverse than the critical focus on Count Dracula, Baron Frankenstein, and Professor Quarter Mass would imply. There were noir pictures and also uh, military comedies and gritty World War II uh, dramas. There was all, even a, page, a periodic take on the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde called The Ugly Duckling, which sounds almost like a trial run for the nutty professor. And of the most direct relevance to the subject of typecasting, there were The Stranglers of Bombay, a movie that blurs the lines between historical melodrama, third world adventure and gothic horror in what Wade ever calls Tower of London on one end and East of Borneo on the other. This was the film for which Amber introduced a settled with sadism approach to historical subjects that would reach his epithesis in Rasputin, the Mad Monk, seven years later, making it easy for both exhibitors and overseas distributors to market it as a horror picture for the uh, for international market uh, that you would naturally expect without leaving the latter feeling as though it had been completely horn swoggled. Uh, now, uh, what what uh, really hits the reviewer? Now, moving beyond the film's surprising reluctance to be historically indefensible and culturally appalling, as the further virtue of being technically not all the sort of picture you ex- expect from a sort of premise in uh, this era, basically said to leaving Hammer uh, down. To begin with, it was shot in black and white, foregoing the gaudy Eastman color and pathy color to already become one of Hammer's most recognizable colleague cards. Color cinematography has been part of the standard package for non-bottom-feeding executive adventure movies since at least The Thief of Baghdad and had figured everyone in the films that Terrence Fisher had directed for Amber previously. The crisp, harsh, monochrome subconsciously puts the Stranglers on Bombay in the same tense emotional footing as Hammer's formative noir thrillers or the horrific sci-fi hybrids directed by Val Guest. Guest's approach as a writer, meanwhile, is recalled by the pessimism of the story in which Lewis's eventual success in forcing his superiors to recognize the existence of the thuggy cult is at best a moral victory. Certainly, it does no immediate good to any of the hundreds of people who he's unable to save over the course of the film. In, fa- in fact, Lewis managed to save literally nobody, and one of the cult's major uh, enablers remains not merely unpunished as the credits roll, but indeed unexposed. As befits his origins as a studio most strongly associated with horror, The Stranglers of Bombay is an atypically dark and morbid adventure movie and remains well worth seeking out despite a few clunky performances and an ending that proves unsatisfying in bad ways as well as good. 